is my pleasure to invite our medalist, Dr. John Ioannidis, to join me at the podium. John Ioannidis, you have observed that a pervasive theme of ancient Greek literature is the need to pursue the truth, whatever the truth may be. In your landmark 2005 paper, Why Most Published Research Findings Are False, you established that research findings are less likely to be true when more teams are involved in the pursuit of statistical significance. That claimed research findings are often simply accurate measures of the prevailing bias. That the hotter the scientific field, the less likely that research findings are true. And that in many instances, fields that claim stronger effects are simply those that have sustained the worst biases. In the Journal of American Medicine, you reveal that of the most highly regarded research findings in recent years, 41% of those retested turned out to be wrong or significantly exaggerated. One might reasonably have expected such assertions to generate opposition or even hostility. Yet, your analyses and proposed solutions have earned widespread praise and acceptance from the scientific community. These include shifting focus from the quest for statistical significance to an improved a priori understanding of a study's ultimate chances for success. Conducting large unbiased studies on established research findings to see how often they are confirmed. And above all, debunking the myth of the heroic lone researcher or team in favor of a cumulative view of work in a given field. John Ioannidis. You have almost single-handedly focused global attention on the pervasive fallibility of biomedical research. Yet, ultimately, you humbly have declared that you consider yourself privileged to learn from interactions with students and young scientists from all over the world and to be constantly reminded that in your words, you know next to nothing for your brilliant, courageous pursuit of truth, wherever it leads, we are proud to present you with the Teachers College Medal for Distinguished Service. Dear President Furman, dear Provost, dear Professor Garber, dear faculty, dear trustees, uh, dear graduates, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor for me to receive the Medal for Distinguished Service from Teachers College today. For over a century, your institution has been a top leader in education both nationally and internationally and has pioneered a multitude of transformative ideals, programs, and initiatives that have had a tremendous impact on making our world a better place to live in and to think about. The current faculty and students are continuing with renowned success the same stellar traditions whose foundations were laid by giants like Dewey and Thorndike. Congratulations to the graduates I come from medicine, which is a discipline that is very remote to education, 
one wonders whether physicians have any time to read anything or to do anything outside of medicine. Nevertheless, I consider that my work in science, writing, and scholarship, or my attempted work, is just a continuous effort to try to be educated, to try to learn something myself. In my case, I have to admit that uh, this effort has been extremely unsuccessful. I have managed to learn very little over the years, despite having hopefully the best intentions, wonderful mentors, and no dearth of opportunities to learn in some of the best institutions. Somehow, I feel that I have not managed to take even the very first step and fulfill what ancient Greeks asked about 2,500 2, years ago, gnothi se afton, know thyself. I'm increasingly worried that perhaps what is wrong is that this is not really the first step, the 101 of education. It may be an advanced course, and clearly it takes a lot of effort, and it's very unclear if one can really get there. It takes a lot of education before we can barely scratch the surface of knowing a tiny bit about who we are. Most of the time, perhaps we can learn more by learning and caring about others. As I wrote in my latest book, every man resembles others more than his own self. The major contribution of my best mentors has been that they made my ignorance more manifest and undeniably obvious. I increasingly realized that things that seemed fairly secure in my knowledge are not necessarily so secure. However, I still don't give up. I still try to describe, narrate, probe, and hopefully quantify my ignorance and harness my uncertainty. Over the years, many scientists at all levels, from undergraduate freshmen to experienced faculty, keep approaching me with ideas about projects to do where they want to join forces with me. This has been a very rewarding experience. It keeps me busy, stimulated, or even overstimulated at times. Nevertheless, I tell these people early on that working with me may not be necessarily the best idea. It may end up being a disaster. It clearly diminishes their chances of finding and claiming significant, impressive, and earth-shaking results. I have to alert them that my strong record is pretty strong at demonstrating that significant, impressive, and earth-shaking results are not as significant, impressive, and earth-shaking as they might seem. So if they stick with me, they run the risk of not publishing some work that would otherwise have been publishable in major journals, and perhaps that could have remained unrefuted for a very long time, perhaps even long after they were dead, and certainly long after they had acquired endowed tenure and had received accolades and medals. I also suggest to my collaborators that when we apply for some grant together, it may be best that they take the lead, at a minimum, in describing how important, significant, and innovative the proposal that we have is and what major repercussions it will have. If I were to write these sections as I wish, we would have to write something like that. Dear reviewers, we can only promise to do our best in the proposed research plan. However, statistically speaking, it is highly likely that this work eventually will not be important and it will not lead to any disruptive innovation or major discovery. Please do fund this work that is almost certainly going to be a miserable total disaster. Conversely, whenever I or my colleagues have any idea that has some reasonable chance of being truly important, I generally discourage submitting grant applications about it. We try to work on it with our spare time and wasting our own resources. Uh, well, this amounts mostly to our own inexpensive brain cells. If an idea is really important and innovative, by definition, peer reviewers will not even understand it. 
I seek funding primarily for mediocre ideas. Sadly, my funding record has been very successful. I do not want to sound like a nihilist. Conversely, I celebrate the fact that opportunities for education abound for many people, including myself. I wish that there were more opportunities and that they were available for everybody. I wish that other people also had the same and more opportunities than I do, a member of the despicable 1%. Life is an obligatory continuous education anyhow, even in the absence of structured teaching and disciplined instruction. The question is, what are we exposed to and what we are educated on? I have my own biases here. First, I wish people were exposed more to science. Not necessarily the splashing successes of science and technology, but the true core of science, which is mostly about careful, rigorous, thoughtful work, skillful design and analysis, skeptical interpretation, continuous reevaluation of the evidence, and meticulous validation. I wish that the scientific method could become a more integral part of our everyday lives, reasoning, decision-making, and experience. I wish people could understand better how difficult science is and respect it particularly for its difficulty rather than its miraculous feats. Science is the best thing that has happened to Homo sapiens sapiens. However, in most societies around the world, the voice of science is currently pretty weak compared to the loudspeakers of mass culture, fanaticism, politics, dogma, and intolerance. Even in the most developed countries, we witness an anti-science movement of denialism that is gaining momentum based on sheer absurdity. Educators could be the first and most important line of defense against the spreading irrationality. My second bias would be about arts and humanities. If science is under attack, I'm afraid that arts and humanities are in an even worse, dire situation. As I speak, fundamentalists are destroying monuments of art that have survived over millennia, trying to erase history and human experience. In more developed countries, such as the US or Europe, Perhaps we do not shatter ancient statues and temples with sledgehammers and bulldozers, but we still shatter our own soul by not supporting and allowing high quality art and humanities to flourish and accepting them to be replaced by mass consumption products of the lowest quality denominator. No fundamentalist will destroy our civilization in the future. We are pretty secure. Our civilization in the arts and humanities may not even exist, and one cannot shatter what does not exist. Again, educators can be the first and most important line of defense against the spreading extinction of humanism. I'm confident that visionary educators will always rise to the occasion to defend science, humanity, and the human experience. Your institution has proven again and again that visionary educators can change the world for the better. I don't even know what exactly it will take to change the world for the better in the future. It will probably be people like you who are ready to celebrate humanity with all its breadth and all its unlimited potential for meaningful evolution. I look forward to continue celebrating your future transformative work and successes and to keep being taught and learning from all of you. Thank you.